हेलो गुड आफ्टरनून मैम गुड आफ्टरनून लता गुड आफ्टरनून मैम गुड आफ्टरनून सूर्या गुड आफ्टरनून मैम सुधा गुड आफ्टरनून I hope I'm calling the right name. I'm just going by the names that I see here. Yes, ma'am. Ma Correct. <laughs> Good afternoon, Gopika. So today is my last class, and uh, I thought I'll give you some pointers on how to write essays and just discuss some of the questions regarding the assignment, etc. Okay. Uh, I have a presentation, so let me go to my presentation. Okay, let me start um, sharing my screen with you. Can you see my slide? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so let's start. Huh? So, uh, regarding your essays, okay, like you know that this assignment that you have to write, you have to write five essays, and I thought I will give you some pointers on how to write an essay. Okay, although we have been writing essay right from you know, I mean, our early grades itself. just to give you a kind of round up on what is the best way to approach an essay i am doing this because often when i get assignments to value i see that people have just you know written from here and there and there is no structure there is it's just going on and on uh, ultimately getting lost in the whole answer it doesn't make sense so i thought i'll just give you some pointers so that you know when you are asked to write an essay it has a shape it has a structure and how you can adapt it so the kind of essay that i'll be talking to you right now would be about a basic essay structure uh, this is actually uh, just to help you to understand because when you are writing your essay uh, being in the post graduate class you are not expected a basic to write a basic essay okay you will be expected to write more than this but the structure is the same whether you write a longer essay or the basic essay the structure is the same so i thought i'll begin with that so some pointers as far as your essay writing is concerned so uh, the basic essay structure now uh, first we, when we talk about the essay we will be talking about uh, the introductory paragraph the first part of your essay will be the introduction and it should begin by telling the reader specifically what topic your essay is addressing okay near the end of your introduction should be your thesis statement which is clear and concise statement that presents your argument the last sentence of the introduction should be a transitional sentence that relates to the first body paragraph of the essay so when you begin writing the first paragraph is what we call as a introduction and that introduction we will be doing this uh, task of telling your reader what is the topic of your essay okay what are you addressing okay and near the end of the introduction should be your thesis statement the point that you wish to make that's what is a thesis statement and when you go towards the last part of the introductory paragraph you will be uh, making sort of a transition okay to the first body paragraph a smooth movement a transition is something that signals a smooth movement from one section of the uh, essay to the next section of the essay and uh, can you see the uh, first body paragraph the part of the uh, slide which is titled first body paragraph can you see that yes ma'am okay so the first, so once the introduction is over and you have uh, established what it is about the essay that you are going to write about the points that you are going to make you make a transition you go into the first body paragraph 
Now, the second part of the essay okay, should be the first body paragraph. And it should present the strongest point that proves your thesis statement. So when we write essays, we have certain points, right? We, we have already formulated certain points that we want to put forward in our essay. So the, the one that's the strongest, okay, uh, would be put first, okay? So the strongest body point, the strongest point comes in the first body paragraph. And it should present uh, the strongest point that proves your thesis statement. Now, the first sentence of this paragraph should tie into the transitional sentence in the introduction. Uh, the transitional thing is done so that the flow is there when, uh, when a reader reads your essay, there is a smooth flow from one section to the other. Then subsequent sentences should describe specific examples that relate to the point you're arguing in the paragraph. Okay, so one paragraph will be about one particular point. And when you make a point, you cannot just make a point and leave it there. If it's a, about the novel that you're writing, you've made one point, okay? You can't leave it there. You have to substantiate it with examples that you take from the, step, from the text, okay? So uh, subsequent sentences, once you make the thesis statement or once you make the main point in your body paragraph, you will have to follow it up with uh, examples, okay, which illustrate the points that you're making. Then, the la like the last sentence in the introduction, the last sentence in this paragraph, that's a body paragraph, also should be transitional, which leads the argument into the next body paragraph. And then you go on to the next body paragraph, the second body paragraph, okay. The third part of your five paragraph essay should present the second most compelling argument in your thesis. The first sentence should uh, tie into the transitional sentence in the first body paragraph, and you should clearly state the argument you're presenting in this paragraph near the beginning of the paragraph. So first part of the paragraph itself, you should uh, very clearly delineate which is a point that you're going to be making in the second body paragraph. And again, like we did previously, we illustrated with suitable examples. So use examples to support this argument in subsequent sentences and end the paragraph with another transitional sentence that takes you into your third and final body paragraph. Okay, so we wrote an introductory paragraph. We wrote the first body paragraph. We wrote the second body paragraph. And when you end the second body paragraph, you write another transitional sentence that takes you into the third body paragraph. Now, the final body paragraph is the fourth part of the five paragraph essay. And this section should present your weakest argument in support of your thesis statement. Weakest argument in the sense that it, is the, it need not be in that sense also. It can be the third point that you want to make, okay? And I mean, this is a basic structure. You should develop it further for your uh, postgraduate assignment essays, okay? Although this may be your weakest argument, do not suggest this in the essay or overcompensate by providing too many examples, okay? Just treat it as another uh, body paragraph. It doesn't, uh, it, the third point with, in which, we, which we are calling as a weakest point doesn't necessarily mean that you have to pre present it like that or point it out in the paragraph like that. Just treat it as any other body paragraph. Now end the third body paragraph with a concluding statement that makes it obvious to the reader that this is a final major point that you will make. And then since you have uh, talked about the thesis, the main topic of your essay, you have substantiated that with three different examples in the three different body uh, paragraphs, okay? Then we go to the conclusion. The final part of the five paragraph essay is the conclusion and this paragraph should restate the thesis statement, but the restatement should not be a duplicate of the thesis statement itself. So don't use the same words, change the words, okay? Don't repeat yourself. The conclusion should also summarize the three major points you addressed in each body paragraph, okay? So uh, the main points that you addressed, you talked about in the body paragraph should be summarized uh, in, in a very short form, okay? The final sentence of the conclusion should be a clear signal that the essay has ended and it may also include an application to your argument or something that the reader can think about after he has finished reading the essay. 
So this is uh, basically the way in which your essay should be structured. Now we'll go into the uh, details. Okay, I'll tell you what it is. You know, many of these things I don't know whether you understood it. We'll go into the details and then you'll understand what I'm talking about. See, restatement of the thesis. The conclusion paragraph should restate the thesis. To be most effective, it's recommended that the writer uses language that echoes but not duplicate language used throughout the paper. So when you restate the thesis in the concluding paragraph, you are actually saying something that you have already said before in your thesis. But the difference is that when you repeat it in the concluding paragraph, you are not going to be using the same language. Change the language. Okay, So it does not duplicate the language, but uh, actually talks about the same point. So you're going to be restating it. So that is you have to take care of that. Then for longer papers, which is what we're talking about, right? For longer papers, see, although for shorter essays, the introduction is usually just one paragraph. Longer argument or research papers may require more substantial introduction. The first paragraph might consist of just the attention grabber and some narrative about the problem. So uh, if when you're writing a longer essay, like the essay that you are expected to write, you know, uh, the introduction need not stick to just one paragraph. The introductory paragraph could even be like an attention grabber something that draws the attention of the reader to what you're writing. That is an attention grabber. And uh, it could be some narrative about the problem, you know, whichever problem is stated in the question, it could be some more information about that. Then you might have one or more paragraphs that provide the background on the main topics of the paper and present the overall argument, concluding with your thesis statement. So in this case, we are not going to be sticking to just one paragraph introduction. We may need more than that, okay, to talk about the uh, what the question is about, give some background information, talk about the points that we are going to be making, make our thesis point. So that could go into more than one introductory paragraph. Now, your thesis in a literary essay, what is this thesis that we are talking about? Your thesis in the literary analysis essay is the point that you want to make about the text. It's a core argument that gives your essay direction and prevents it from being just a collection of random observations about a text. So random observations about a text does not make an answer. Okay, You just write like whichever question you get, you write the summary of the whole novel that does not make an answer. So you, when you read the question properly, understand what they are asking you, and your answer should be something that actually answers what is asked of you. Okay? It should uh, demonstrate that you have understood the question and you are able to answer accordingly. So when you write the thesis in the literary analysis essay, the, it talks about the points that you want to make about the text. It's the core argument that gives your essay direction. For you also, as a student, it's good when you zero in, when you uh, you know narrow it down. Otherwise, it'd be too broad, much more than you can probably address. So, when you are addressing the question that's asked of you, it actually gives direction to your essay, and it prevents the essay from drifting all over the place. If you're given a prompt for your essay, your thesis must answer or relate to the prompt. Prompt in the sense, the question here. To support your thesis statement, your essay will build an argument using textual evidence, specific parts of the text that demonstrate your point. This evidence is quoted, analyzed throughout your essay to explain your argument to the reader. So we are almost like, uh, you know, lawyers, you can say, when you make a case in the court, you just don't say something, right? You need evidence to substantiate what you're saying. So similarly, when we have said something in the thesis statement, our essay should build what we have said in the thesis statement using textual evidence. Textual evidence can come in the form of quotations that you can use, which should be explained in the uh, succeeding uh, parts of the essay. The essay introduction provides a quick overview of where your argument is going. It should include your thesis statement and the summary of the essay structure. So the person 
reading your introduction should understand very quickly when they read your introduction what is this student talking about okay what is uh, uh, being uh, talked about in this particular essay and that is got from the thesis itself and also it covers a quick uh, overview of the structure of your essay imagine that you are making three different points in the three body paragraphs so uh, a small uh, you know introduction to that should be there in your introductory paragraph because then the reader knows what to expect in the body paragraphs so that should also be there in uh, the thesis statement okay uh, th that actually is like the blueprint of the rest of the essay Uh, which tells us you know these are the points that that we can we can look forward to in the next body paragraph so that should be encapsulated in the thesis typical structure for an introduction is to begin with a general statement about the text and author identify okay which text is it who is the author very crucial even for annotations i'm sure you've got in the instructions right you they, when you annotate also it's very crucial to identify uh which is the text who is the author from which part of the text is it so for the novel you need to identify which novel is it and who is the author so use a general uh, statement about text and the author and using that you could go into your thesis statement then you can end with a brief indication of what is coming up in the main body of the essay that's what i was telling you so an indication of what is going to come in the body paragraphs okay the points that are come going to come in your body paragraphs brief indication it doesn't mean you have to write a lengthy introduction to that just a brief introduction just a brief uh, signal of what is going to come in the body paragraphs okay now this is called sign posting it will be more elaborated longer essays so this is called sign posting the reader knows okay okay these are the points that i am supposed to look out for in the next part of the essay so that is called sign posting so your introduction should can begin with uh, a general statement identifying the text and the author and then go on to talk about the problem that is being asked of you go into your thesis explain your standpoint on this uh, particular topic and then end with sign posting which is like a brief introduction of the points that you wish to make regarding the question and these points are what we can look forward to in each of the body paragraphs is that clear yes ma'am yeah okay go now i'll show you what it is okay just instead of just saying i'll show you with an example what what i'm talking about Look at this. This is the opening paragraph, okay, of an essay. Uh, it's about Frankenstein. Okay, so uh, what I have highlighted there is an opening sentence there, and the introduction you can see there opens with a commonly held assumption about the text. It's a general statement about the text. In this case, see, it is about Frankenstein. Now, see what is highlighted there. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is often read as a crude cautionary tale about the dangers of scientific advancement unrestrained by ethical considerations in this reading protagonist victor frankenstein is a stable representation of the callous ambition of modern science throughout the novel so two sentences we have there which uh, talks about what the novel is about right for example if it uh, if it were about Hmm, heart of darkness right we can immediately begin by saying that this novel is about a journey right into the heart of uh, belgian congo right and uh, what more would you think relevant to add there you could add there as a general statement which would be like the opening sentences in your introductory paragraph okay now going on the same paragraph okay now we see the part where we come to the thesis statement so it's the same paragraph okay we began with the introductory part now we are going to the thesis statement now the thesis statement when you read you will understand that the writer is taking a position against the common assumption and sums up the main argument that will be put forward in the essay so uh, what is expressed in the general statements okay 
is not what is going to be there in the thesis statement what is the writer what is the student or the writer of the essay going to say the position that the writer of the essay is going to talk about that's it this essay however argues that far from providing a stable image of the character shelley uses shifting narratives narrative perspectives to portray frankenstein in an increasingly negative light as the novel goes on okay so we understand that this essay will be talking about how the character changes as the novel goes on while he initially appears to be naive but sympathetic idealist after the creature's narrative frankenstein began begins to resemble even in his own telling the thoughtlessly cruel figure the creature represents him as so the metamorphosis in the character of frankenstein as the novel progresses we understand that this is what the essay is going to be talking about that is what we call as the thesis statement okay do you understand that how the thesis statement comes out very clearly what the essay is going to be talking about okay yes ma'am yeah and then we go to the last section of the introductory paragraph the sign posting that we talked about the same it this is the same paragraph okay now see this essay begins by exploring so this is like the blueprint of what's going to be there in the rest of the essay okay this essay explains uh, sorry begins by exploring the positive portrayal of frankenstein in the first volume then moves on to the creature's per perception of him and finally discusses the third volume's narrative shift towards viewing frankenstein as the creature views it so you see there how it begins you know first this happens then that happens and finally this happens look at the structure of that sentence it's worded in such a way that you get three divisions there which will be the components of the three body paragraphs so this is sign posting that the reader gets actually a blueprint of what is going to be there what the reader can expect in the rest of the essay is that clear to you so an introduction yes, written like this with uh, uh, you know a general introduction about the general concept about the novel then addressing the question and the writer's perspective which forms the thesis and ending with a sign posting there we get uh, an overview of the layout of the rest of the essay so that is what uh, typically a good introduction should contain now let's go to the structure of a paragraph see a typical structure for a literary analysis essay consists of five paragraphs three paragraphs of the body plus the introduction and the conclusion typical five paragraph essay structure which is a basic essay structure actually each paragraph in the main body should focus on one topic okay the body paragraphs each paragraph should uh, focus on one topic in the five paragraph model try to divide your argument into three main areas of analysis or linked to your thesis okay don't try to include everything you can think of to say about the text only analysis that drives your argument this is a very important point don't write just any thing that you feel you know can be written only write points that address the question in uh, you know which i was question that we are talking about the question in perspective okay so write points that drives your analysis forward that takes your argument forward okay now uh, this is about five paragraph essay for you in the longer essay the same principle applies on a broader scale okay just you have to expand it that's all for example see you might have two or three sections in your main body each with multiple paragraphs within these sections you still want to begin new paragraphs at logical moments a turn in the argument or introduction of new ideas so the number of body paragraphs will not be three it will be more than that okay when it is a longer essay but even within those paragraph the structure will have to be followed now to talk about the structure of a paragraph you know when you begin see uh, you begin with topic sentences to keep your points focused it's important to use a topic sentence at the beginning of each paragraph 
A good topic sentence allows a reader to see at a glance what the paragraph is about. It can introduce a new line of argument and connect or contrast it with the previous paragraph. So uh, you begin a new paragraph with a topic sentence, and that topic sentence actually uh, gives a very clear picture of what this whole paragraph is about. Okay, it can link to the previous paragraph, or it can even bring in a contrast to the point written in the previous paragraph, depending on how what kind of essay we are writing. And what kind of points we want to make? Now, use wor transition words. Okay, words like however or moreover are useful for creating smooth transitions. So, for example, see the there's a sentence that's given here. The, the story's focus, therefore, is not upon the divine revelation that may be waiting beyond the door, but upon the mundane process of aging undergone by man as he waits. Next paragraph, beginning. Look at that. There is a transition word there. Nevertheless, the radiance that appears to stream from the door is typically treated as religious symbolism. So topic sentence signals you know, that the paragraph will address the question of religious uh, symbolism, while the linking word nevertheless points out a contrast with the previous paragraph's conclusion. Do you understand that? I use the word or I mean, in this uh, illustration, in this example, see, we see that the first uh, paragraph, the ending of the first paragraph and the beginning of the second paragraph. Look at that, how it shifts, right? The, the contrast comes out in the next paragraph. And how does the contrast come out? By using this word, nevertheless, right? So nevertheless brings out the contrast. So it's the use, it's an example of the use of a transition word to help bring out a contrast. Now, it's not necessary that it always has to bring out a contrast. It can also be uh, putting forward the same idea. However, it's always good to use a transition word because that will help uh, the essay to flow more smoothly okay? from point to point. It will help in the flow of the essay. So uh, keep in mind, use transition words. Then uh, using textual evidence. See, a key part of literary analysis is backing up your argument. Literary analysis is the kind of questions that you're asked, right? Whether it is to analyze a novel uh, from certain perspective or um, uh, analyze characters, right? Relationships between characters. All of this, you're doing literary analysis there. So a key part of literary analysis is backing up your arguments with relevant evidence from the text. This involves introducing quotes from the text and explaining their significance to your point. So uh, you don't make a point and leave it there. You need to, uh, you know, give more, uh, more strength to your points by putting in relevant examples using quotations from the text. Uh, it's important to contextualize quotes and explain why you are using them. And and if you use quotes, if you uh, don't contextualize it. It still doesn't do any purpose. Okay, it, does, it still doesn't help you. Just putting a quote there, you know, like dropping a bomb. It doesn't do anything unless you put it in context. You explain why this quote is relevant to the point that you have made. Who says this? At what point is this said? And how does it apply to the points that you have made? That, that explanation should be there in your answer. So it's important to contextualize quotes and explain why you're using them. And they should be properly introduced and analyzed and not treated as self-explanatory. Put the quote there and think that the teacher who values your paper will understand that. No, it doesn't work like that. It, it has to be explained. That explanation is part of the examiner understanding that you have understood what you're trying to explain. Explain the quote, the, the significance of the quote. Now, Blake asks, uh, that's an example, okay? Blake asks, what dread hand could have created the tiger, subverting the usual sense of joy in God's creation and conveying instead a sense of fearful awe? Look at that. It's, uh, which poem? Can anyone say? It's very obvious. The tiger. Exactly, Blake's tiger, right? So tiger, tiger, that's how it begins. So look at this. 
the, we have used a coat there a small coat it's an example of uh, a small coat that has been used there he blake asked what red hand within quotations you begin the quote marks and you end the quote marks that's also important okay could have created the tiger subverting the usual sense of joy in god's creation and conveying instead a sense of fearful awe so when we use that quote there we have not just dropped it there without any context right we have explained it the rest of the sentence is explaining that this is a way in which the uh, there is a sort of subversion happening we are here filled with a sense of a uh, fearful or rather than a jubilant joy in a god's creation that is explained there so this is how we use a quote it's an example of how we can use a quote now it's all it's not always necessary to use a quote also especially in your novel answers if the quote is too long i mean maybe for an assignment you can because you can refer and you you can bring in a lengthy quote also not too lengthy definitely medium length also is possible but when you are writing it for the university exam it's not possible sometimes for us to remember huge quotes right so what we do uh, in such circumstances see quoting is useful when you're discussing the author's language but sometimes you'll have to refer to plot points or structural elements also not only lengthy quotes so even when you're talking about plot points or structural elements of a novel that cannot be captured in a short quote see in the in these cases what we do is see we paraphrase or summarize parts of the text that is to describe the relevant part in our own words this is what we do uh, an example here is see the initial and final sections of the novel consists of walton's letters to his sister it's significant that the entirety of frankenstein and the creature's narratives are ostensibly transcribed by walton in these letters so here we are talking about different sections of the novel but we are not going to be using the entire section of the novel because it's impossible to do that it's too much to do that and it's not a feasible thing so we paraphrase it or we summarize it in our own words okay we are not going to be copying from any work we are going to be using it in our own words this is what we can do so uh, when you make a point substantiate with textual evidence use quotes if it is short and usable if it is too long what we can do is paraphrase or summarize in our own words okay so that's what that is about now writing a conclusion so we talked about how to write a body paragraph and then uh, uh, when we conclude how do we do that okay see the conclusion of your analysis should not introduce any new quotations or arguments instead it's about wrapping up the essay here you summarize your key points and try to emphasize their significance to the reader so we have we've said all that we want to say now the final uh, paragraph which is a conclusion paragraph we are not going to introduce any new topic or new quotations we are just going to be uh, reemphasizing the key points that we have already made earlier a good way to approach this is to briefly summarize your key arguments in new words don't use the same words okay? and emphasize the conclusion that they have led you to highlighting the new perspective your thesis provides on the text as a whole so that's how we should end it now uh, look at this there is an example here again from the frankenstein essay itself look at the concluding paragraph here okay now see a uh, we are making a summary there right so the first part of the concluding paragraph yeah, we can make a recap of the points that we have already made in the essay so the conclusion actually starts with the summarization or a recap of the points that we have already made and look at that that a blue highlighted part is the beginning of the conclusion and we are uh, kind of making a recap of the points we have already made in the essay a restatement so by tracing the depiction of frankenstein through the novel's three volumes i have demonstrated how the narrative uh, structure shifts our perception of the character while the frankenstein of the first volume is depicted as having innocent intention the second and third volume first in the creature's accusatory voice then in his own voice increasingly undermine him causing him to appear alternately ridiculous and vindictive this is the point that we have established in our essay and we beginning our conclusion by 
uh, talking about that. Uh, although in this essay example, uh, you can see the use of first person. It's generally not, uh, I, I don't think you should use a first person. Better to avoid using the first person. Okay, I don't use the word I there. Okay? Uh, try avoiding uh, the use of the first person. That's my suggestion. Then going on uh, to the next part of this uh, concluding paragraph, see in the analysis of that. Now, this is how we're making the concluding point, uh, the green highlight. See, the central argument we have emphasized showing how the analysis has contributed a new perspective. So see, far from the one-dimensional villain, he's often taken to be the character of Frankenstein is compelling because of the dynamic narrative frame in which he's placed. In this frame, Frankenstein's narrative self-presentation uh, responds to the image of him we see from others' perspective. So that is uh, how we made that concluding point there. What did we achieve through our uh, points and our arguments? What did we achieve? That makes the concluding point. And the last part, see where uh, we actually point out the significance. What is the significance of this understanding? Okay, it's like, uh, uh, how does it have a wider implication? That's what comes in the last sentence there. See, this conclusion ends by linking the essay's argument to broader ideas. So what is the wider significance of what we have pointed out? Now look at this the highlighted area there. This conclusion sheds new light on the novel, foregrounding Shelley's unique layering of narrative perspectives and its importance for the depiction of character. So uh, this is how we write a concluding paragraph. We begin by making a summary, recapping the points that we made in the essay. Then we make the concluding uh, point, which is a central argument, which is emphasized again and showing what is the stance that we have taken. What is the point we have emphasized? And we end it by talking about the significance of the points that we have made to a wider perspective. Okay, In a larger picture, how is this significant? So this is a, a way in which a concluding paragraph should be written. Now, uh, going uh, further in more, into more detail regarding the body paragraphs. Once you've written your introduction, you'll take the arguments you've developed and turn them into your body paragraphs. Okay. So when you make your body paragraph, we begin with a topic sentence, a strong topic sentence. So again, topic sentences are like signs on a highway. They tell the reader where they are and where they are going. A good topic sentence not only alerts reader to what issue will be discussed in that particular paragraph, but also gives us a sense of what argument will be made about that issue. That is a topic sentence. What are we going to say in this paragraph? Okay. Oh, what is the point that I'm going to be talking about in this paragraph? That is the topic sentence. Okay. It gives the reader a clear idea of the point that is going to be made in that paragraph. Then again, uh, using transitions effectively. See, good literary essay writers know that each paragraph must be clearly and strongly linked to the material around it. Think of each paragraph as a response to the one that precedes it. So uh, it, one has to flow uh, very smoothly into the next. One paragraph flowing smoothly into the next. And use transition words and phrases such as however, similarly, on the contrary, therefore, furthermore, etc. to indicate what kind of uh, response that you are making. So uh, having a good... Uh, uh, transition, you know, is very effective uh, overall when you write your essay. Now, I'll uh, show you the structure of an essay here. Okay? This one, you can see uh, typically, you know, how an essay should be constructed. On the left side, you see the introduction, which is like 10 percentage of the total length of your essay. Okay, Maybe one paragraph or several, depending on the length of essay that you're required to write. Uh, that see, uh, so that's actually the general part of it, right? From the general part, the introduction is the general part of the essay. 
uh, what the things that we can do with the introduction is see introduce the topic provide background information limit the scope of discussion which aspect of the novel are we going to discuss here right is it about the plot is it about the character is it about the narration which aspect of the discussion uh, is going to come up here then define the state or define sorry define slash state the topic or question so uh, what is this question asking understand the question and define it okay present the plan of coverage including your line of argument viewpoint and conclusions all that should come in the first paragraph uh, note you can set your own agenda to avoid over generalization or too broad a focus too broad a focus will thin out your essay it will dull out your essay okay that sharpness will be lost so it will not have the power that you can get if it is a very well defined essay so from that general uh, uh, aspect we go on to the more specific aspects which will be covered in the body paragraphs and look at the structure that is given there of a body paragraph see you have a topic sentence starting with a topic sentence each paragraph should have one main point and examples to illustrate that main point and then uh, you go on to a concluding sentence in the paragraph which is like a link to the uh, next paragraph okay and then in the next paragraph you go with again with the topic sentence which talks about which point in uh, your argument is going to be covered in that paragraph substantiated with examples again i conclude with the sentence that smoothly takes you links you to the next body paragraph okay look at this in this uh, you can see how that is shown topic sentence then ending the paragraph with a link beginning again with a topic sentence uh, ending with a link and going on like that okay until we reach the conclusion okay and uh, in the conclusion what we do is we sum up our argument or information with reference to the essay question and also end with wider implications or wider significance of uh, our answer okay so this is in short what the essay is supposed to be i am pointing this out to you because i don't want you to uh, completely be at a loss when faced with this uh, question of writing an essay in an assignment Uh, you can you do have time to read think uh, understand and then make your points and then put it out there on paper uh, don't you know make your essays uh, i mean mediocre by just writing a summary no matter which novel you are asked just put in a summary there it doesn't work like that okay so understand the question and answer according to what is expected of you does that make it clearer for you the structure of the essay yes ma'am okay i hope it helps you and uh, in case you want to understand this further there are several helpful materials all over the internet just look for the structure of an essay you will find a lot of helpful materials okay so understand that and then you start writing it's going to help you not only in this paper in every paper that you write it's going to help you all right then let me go uh, into this i just wanted to give you some more details about literary realism like in the last class we talked about literary realism what is literary realism okay it's a literary movement that represents reality by portraying mundane everyday experiences as they are in real life it depicts familiar people places stories primarily about the middle and lower classes of society and literary realism seeks to tell a story as truthfully as possible instead of dramatizing it or romanticizing and literary realism existed in some form in england before the genre was fully defined uh, especially in earlier times you know some critics credit the first british novelists like daniel defoe and samuel richardson as realists because they wrote about issues related to the middle class so realism is depicting life as it really is for the middle class okay uh, the kind of you know 
places that these people visit the kind of people that they interact with uh, especially you know the lower classes of society or the middle class of society now once realism took shape george eliot published middle march and we know uh, what a detailed study it was about middle march the cross section of uh, characters we met for <coughs> some in middle march uh, which is uh, considered the most famous work of literary realism to come from the united kingdom the genre developed in parallel with uk's new middle class and authors took the opportunity to echo their interests and concerns so uh, literary realism was something that actually existed in some form in england before uh, the genre of the category itself was more fully defined uh, you can see examples in uh, the way uh, richardson wrote or even later on george eliot in middle march represented uh, the social reality then uh, times uh, types of literary real, realism what are the different types of literary realism uh, that is you know extend uh, or that is in vogue now so there are different types of literary realism each with its own distinct characteristics now, first one that we're going to talk about is magical realism you remember we talked about all this in the last part of uh, the novel that we studied uh, previous class uh, how the british novel has moved forward so we mentioned magical realism a type of realism that blurs the lines between fantasy and reality magical realism portrays the world truthfully plus adds magical elements that are not found in our reality but are still considered normal uh, in the world the story takes place uh, for example salman rushdie's midnight's children if you have watched the film or read the novel you know that you know not life as normal is presented but the, there are elements of magic added into it which is added as if it's nothing magical just quite normally it is added into it okay so that kind of uh, uh, feature is what we say uh, is magical realism so the lines of reality and the lines of uh, fantasy actually uh, blurs and joins together and you find magic magical elements uh, you know uh, introduced into this world in a very usual uh, uh, unsurprising way uh, the best example is 100 years of solitude by gabriel garcia marquez uh, and it's a it's a novel about a man who invents a town according to his own perceptions so if you read gabriel garcia marquez books even his short stories you will find elements of magical realism as also rushdie's novels then uh, social realism see a type of realism that focuses focuses on the lives and living conditions of the working class uh, and the poor example is le mirable by victor hugo it's a social novel about class and politics in france in the early 1800 so social realistic novel and then kitchen sink realism another offshoot of social realism social realism you know another uh, another branch of social realism we can say is a kitchen sink realism what is that see it focuses on the lives of young working class british men who spend their free time drinking in pubs okay so uh, the reality in the lives of these men as soon as the work is over going to the pubs and drinking in the pubs that kind of life the working class life room at the top by john brain uh, is a kitchen sink realist novel that's an example of a young man with big ambitions who struggles to realize his dreams in a post war britain post war britain where jobs were scarce making money was not easy people were living with all sorts of hardships and many uh, people frequented pubs and uh, that was part of the hard realism that they had to confront so that is kitchen sink realism then uh, socialist realism a type of realism created by joseph stalin and adopted by communists social realism glor glorifies the struggle of the proletariat the common man the struggle of the common man cemented by fyodor gladkov 
is a socialist realist novel about the struggles of reconstructing the soviet union after the russian revolution so uh, sub subdivisions of the social realism okay jinsink realism socialist realism another one is naturalism see uh, extreme form of realism that is naturalism okay it was influenced by darwin's theories of evolution Naturalism was founded by Emil Zola. So it explores the belief that science can explain all social and environmental phenomena. A rose for Emily by Faulkner. It's an example. A short story about a recluse with a mental illness whose fate is already determined. It's an example of naturalism. So uh, a kind of realism that believes uh, that. you know science can explain every social and environmental phenomena which takes its roots from darwin's theories of evolution uh, important novelist in this uh, regard is emil zola then we have another uh, branch psychological realism a type of realism that is character driven focusing on what motivates them to make certain decisions and why okay so uh, driven by a character and the psychology of a particular character what motivates a character to take certain actions certain decisions and why so psychological realism sometimes uses characters to express commentary on social or political issues social issues or political issues you know it, it kind of talks about the mental state and what is triggering the mental state of a particular character example is uh, dostoevsky's crime and punishment it's a psychological realist novel about a man who hatches a plan to kill a man and take his money to get out of poverty but feels immense guilt and paranoia after he does it so uh, uh, crime and punishment you know a man plotting to kill another man to take his money but after having done it he feels terribly guilty any other character that comes to your mind when i say this a man commits murder and then feels guilty about what he has done can you think of any other character that hamlet comes to me hamlet uh, did hamlet commit a murder he kills his uncle no ma Uh, it's all about his uh, deliberations Body. on whether he could he should kill right playboy of the western world uh okay um uh, uh, sure hamlet hamlet killing ophelia's father polonius killing polonius uh no, Ophi- okay you have a better stronger uh, stronger yes. example which one which play of shakespeare you're right about shakespeare i i was thinking about a play about shakespeare but i was thinking about macbeth okay does that make sense now macbeth and all the murders that he commits and uh, what is the tragic flaw in macbeth you no know, because of his overweening ambition right he commits all these uh, crimes and then he ends up feeling extremely guilty about what he has done there is a fam- famous uh, passage in uh, macbeth where lady macbeth is washing her hands incessantly right and she still sees uh, stains of blood right so the, that is about the psychology the psychology i was watching recently a malayalam movie the new malayalam movie called joji i don't know whether any one of you watched it did anyone watch uh, yes ma'am Fahad Fazal's movie Joji. That th- there also you see the psychological uh, reality of that man there, right? What he commits and driven by what he has done, right? He is haunted by what he has done. The murders that he commits one after the other, right? To hide one murder, he does the other one, and and the kind of you know guilt that eats him up. So uh, psychological realism there. I was just giving you examples, okay? So. Uh, we are talking about types of literary realism and we talked about magical realism social realism kitchen sink realism socialist realism naturalism and psychological realism okay this is uh, there in you know the last part of your uh, last unit now uh, 
how do you analyze a novel okay you are going to be asked uh, a lot of uh, i mean as students of literature as students studying the novel you should know how to analyze a novel okay now the first aspect that can be this is the most simple way to put it okay the first uh, way in which that we can approach the analysis of a novel is by uh, looking at the setting okay this what is setting it's a description of where and when the story takes place okay where does it happen what aspects make up the setting geography weather time of day social conditions okay imagine this with respect to the novels that we have studied uh, wuthering heights or uh, conrad's uh, journey in the steamboat all of these see, what is uh, about what is it about the setting that plays a role in the story okay the weather whether it's the time of the day or the social conditions there what role does setting play in the story is it an important part of the plot or theme or is it just a backdrop against which the actions take place so in wuthering heights the setting is very important right especially in the haunting scene and you know the rain lashed moors so the setting is very important there study the time period which is also part of the setting when was the story written does it take place in the present the past or the future uh, how does the time period affect the language atmosphere or social circumstances of the novel uh, it can affect right the when is the story written which, which time period does it capture that can uh, uh, affect the way in which everything else is presented in the novel whether it is a language uh, or whether it is a appearance of the characters all of that dictate in which time period this novel is written so a uh, setting talks about not only the locality but also the time period in which a particular work is written then characterization see how are the characters described okay now they can be described through dialogue right the, the kind of words that they themselves speak uh, then the physical appearance thoughts and feelings uh, interaction the way they act towards the other characters which gives us which, which is like you know which are like clues that we get right imagine us as detectives as investigators you, know, you understand things about the characters when you see or when you hear them speak and when they speak to others right and and when we also understand the way in which they think so all these are indicators of a uh, characterization then uh, are they static characters who do not change or do they develop by the end of the story what type of characters are there what qualities stand out okay uh, maybe they have uh, tom jones for example has a lot of uh, makes a lot of mistakes but still he becomes a lovable character because he learns from it and he redeems himself like that so what qualities stand out are they stereotypes uh, blissful others can be said to be like stereotypical villainous characters right uh, are characters believable sometimes characters are larger than life and it is not a believable character but others others are pretty believable characters also so uh, th- that is those are the things that you could ask questions that you could ask to develop your analysis of a novel now going on to a uh, plot and structure when you analyze a novel you should, it's also important to think about the plot which is like the main sequence of events that make up the story uh, what are the most important uh, events how is the plot structured is it linear chronological or does it move back and forth are there turning points a climax or an anti climax is the plot believable so how does a plot move right I, uh, by the way i hope you know the difference between plot and theme right anyone plot and theme hmm? what is the difference between plot and theme can you hear me hello plot is a theme. small summary ma'am uh, plot is when you suppose you've go- gone and watched a film okay 
and you come back to class the next day and you want to tell what you have watched to your uh, your friend okay you want to narrate what has happened what in the film right so how will you narrate the story of the film in brief how you begin? right how will you begin imagine you're telling the story to your friend imagine and how will you begin it it was a nice story or interesting one or a horror one i may explain like that uh, it was a mystery film ah. my- mysterious okay. or comedy okay then after that what will you say <laughs> maybe about the characters ma'am and who, who who was uh whom i like most the most interesting events that took place is that how you tell a story imagine okay you went you watched a film and when you when you want to tell the story of that film you, to your friend you will only talk about different characters you will only talk about interesting events your friend will say no this is not the way i want to hear the whole story yes yeah, scene by scene maybe <laughs> yeah how well, that's how you'll say right first this happened then yes, this me. happened and then you know what happened that happened and finally the film you know this is what happened in the film right this is the way we narrate the story right yes ma'am in, in so uh, sequence of events you know that happen in the story when you narrate that that becomes the plot okay you got it now yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am ah. and what about the theme what is the difference theme what like are the main said, topics they have discussed there exactly after watching a film or reading a book or whatever it is huh, you come out of it with you know oh this is about love this is about uh, you know uh, greed or like universal messages that you get from having read a book or watched a film that is the theme okay so there is a difference between plot and theme remember that okay now coming yes. back to uh, narrator and point of view see uh, the narrator is the person who is telling the story point of view is whose eyes the story is being told through right we have uh, for example in wuthering heights we have multiple narrators there right uh, the one of the narrators name one of the narrators for me wuthering heights one of the narrators ma'am there are many narrators no the okay. nelly is one, a narrator nelly uh, is a narrator okay. yes Yes, Nelly is a narrator, and, and actually Lockwood, Lockwood, is, Lockwood also. Yeah, yeah Lockwood is, is uh, and Catherine's diary. Exactly, all of these are narrators there. So now yes, you know what it is. Okay, so a uh, point of view is through whose eyes are we uh, approaching the story? For example, Huckleberry Finn. Uh, we are not going to be uh, understanding the story as it happens from the point of view of an adult person. we will uh, be looking at how the story happens through the eye of this child this boy huckleberry say so point of view is whose eye is the story being told through okay so imagine uh, these things are important when you approach a novel now who is the narrator or speaker in the story is the narrator a main character does the author speak through one of the characters for example tom jones the author talks directly to the readers you know in every introductory chapter the author talks directly to the readers right so it is different in different works if the story written in the first person i point of view is the story written in the detached third person he or she perspective is the story written in an all knowing omniscient third person perspective who can reveal what all characters are thinking and all characters are doing in all the places okay so is it a limited point of view or is it an omniscient point of view all that you have to analyze you have to understand then talking about conflict another way to analyze a novel is by looking at the conflict or the tension that is at the heart of the novel and it is related to the main character so how would you uh, describe the main conflict is it internal where the character suffers inwardly is it external caused by the surroundings or environment the main character finds himself or herself in for example in the passage to india right the climax happens actually in the 
cave and what adela feels right so it's both externally manifest there and also internally as to what happens in her mind where she feels that she has been assaulted right so the conflict what what is the conflict about okay how does it affect the central character what it does to aziz right so uh, i'm just giving one example there analyze like this with all the novels that you have studied then theme the theme is a the main idea or lesson or message in the novel it's usually an abstract universal idea about the human condition society or life to name a few how does a the theme shine through in a story okay so if you know the theme of a story and how where are the examples that illustrate the theme uh, are any elements repeated that may suggest a theme what other themes are there so uh, a novel may contain more than one theme right then style or the style has to do with the author's vocabulary use of imaginary tone or feeling of the story imagery sorry use of imagery oh, what is the, what are the images you know uh, that are brought in uh, for example in a portrait of the artist right that several images are brought in uh, image of the girl wading that's when he has an epiphany so it has to do with his attitude towards the subject in some novels the tone can be ironic humorous cold or dramatic now is the text full of figurative language uh, does the author use a lot of symbolism metaphors or similes an example of a metaphor is one uh, so figurative language includes metaphors and similes okay an example of metaphor is one uh, when someone says my love you are a rose uh, an example of a simile is my darling you are like a rose when you introduce like or as Uh, then it becomes a simile but if the uh, comparison is direct without using any words like a, like or as then it becomes a metaphor uh, i hope you know the difference between metaphor and simile so analyze the style that is used in the novel imagery style and imagery used in the novel then these are the things that can help you in analyzing uh, or doing a literary analysis of a novel then uh, i thought that i will also just give you an overview of uh, the different periods in british literature from old english period to the post modern or the present so this is how we can ha uh, have an overview of uh, the literature english literature british literature actually see from the year 450 to 1066 the time of the old english period or you can say the anglo saxon period and after that from uh, 1066 uh, to around 1500 which is what we call as the middle english period uh, and 1500 to 1650 is the renaissance period uh, the reawakening rebirth renaissance and that can be again subdivided into Elizabethan age starting from around 1558 to 1603 the first Elizabeth queen Elizabeth then uh, the time of uh, Jacob uh, we have 1603 to 1625 which we call as a Jacobian age and uh, 1625 to 49 is Carolyn age of Carolyn and 49 to 1660 is the commonwealth period or, or the puritan uh, interregnum this is also called the puritan interregnum uh, and after that comes 1660 to 1785 is the neoclassical period so we have the renaissance and then we have the neoclassical period which is again a subdivided we can say into a period from 1660 to 1700 as the restoration period 1700 to 1745 we call the augustan age or the age of pope and 1745 to 85 is the age of sensibility or the age of johnson and 1785 to 1830 is the romantic period and after the romantic period we have 1832 to 1901 the victorian period the age of queen victoria uh, in that from 1848 to 1860 we can say is a time of the pre raphaelite especially pre raphaelite poets then 1880 to 1901 is a time of aestheticism and decadence 
and after 1901 to the time uh, uh, of 1914 around the war period the edwardian period then 1910 to 1936 is the georgian period and after that 1914 to 1945 is what we call as the modern period and post 45 to the present is the post modern period so this is like you know gives you in a nutshell uh, the different ages uh, in, into which we have loosely divided literature these are not watertight compartments okay this is just divided so that it's easy for us to approach it that's all okay i'll give you more details about each period that we read okay now see first period that we talked about was the old english period or the anglo saxon period it refers to literature produced from the invasion of celtic england by germanic tribes in the first half of the 5th century to the conquest of england in 1066 by william the conqueror that's what we call as the old english period and uh, during the old english period written literature began to develop from oral tradition and in the 8th century poetry written in the vernacular anglo saxon which is known as old english appeared and uh, one of the most well known 8th century old english pieces of literature is beowulf the great germanic epic poem and two poets of the old english period uh, are well known and they wrote on biblical and religious themes and they were caedmund and cynwulf now after the old english period we have the middle english period it consists of literature produced in the four and a half centuries between the norman conquest of 1066 and about 1500 when the standard literary language derived from the dialect of the london area became recognizable as modern english the most widely known of these writings are chaucer's the canterbury tales which are study and uh, anonymous sir gawain and green knight and thomas mallory's moth the other it's about uh, king arthur and the knights of the round table then uh, and after that see we have the english literary renaissance the rebirth yeah, it began with english humanists uh, such as sir thomas more and sir thomas white uh, and consists uh, of four subsets further subdivided into the elizabethan age jacobian age caroline age and commonwealth period so age the elizabethan age of english literature it coincides with the coincides with the uh, reign of elizabeth i from 1558 to 1603 during this time medieval tradition was blended with renaissance optimism uh, this was a time when lyric poetry prose and drama flourished Uh, and uh, some important writers of the age were Shakespeare, Marlowe, Spencer, Walter Raleigh, and Ben Jonson. And they, uh, Marlowe and Shakespeare, especially, you know, were uh, strong rivals, uh, having a strong rivalry between them. And then we have the Jacobian age. Okay, it coincides with the reign of James the First, sixteen o three to sixteen twenty five. During this time, literature became sophisticated, somber, and conscious of social abuse and rivalry. The Jacobian age, that is the age of King James the First, okay, produced rich prose and drama as well as the King James translation of the Bible, King James version of the Bible, important one. Uh, Shakespeare and Johnson wrote during the Jacobian age, as well as uh, John Donne and Francis Bacon. Uh, john donne especially very well known for his, for being a metaphysical poet and also bacon bacon's writings and middleton also uh, then we have the age of caroline caroline age of english literature which coincides with the reign of charles the 1st from 1625 to 1649 the writers of this age wrote with refinement and elegance Uh, this era produced a circle of poets which who were known as cavalier poets and uh, dramatists of this age were the last to write in the elizabethan tradition because after that you know came this commonwealth period which is also known as the puritan interregnum uh, it this includes literature produced during the time of the puritan leader uh, oliver cromwell you know the monarchy was suspended for a time 
and Oliver Cromwell took over uh, power in England, calling himself a protector, and England was called a protectorate. Uh, they were Puritans. Uh, this period produced the political writings of Milton. Milton was a strong supporter of the Puritans. And this was a time that uh, Milton's treatises, not only uh, Paradise Lost, and uh, that actually came afterwards. Uh, his strong treatises, uh, there are treatises on divorce, etc., that he has written uh, during this time. Thomas Hobbes' political treatise, Leviathan, the prose of Andrew Marvin. In September of 1642, the Puritans closed theatres on moral and religious grounds. Puritans uh, followed very austere ways, very spartan and strict in their outlook. They did not believe in the frivolity and uh, the lightheartedness or uh, believe in going to theatres. Well, Elizabethan age is known for its theatres, right? But when the Puritans came, the theatres were closed. And for the next 18 years, the theatres remained closed, accounting for the lack of drama produced during this time period. So Commonwealth period. Then we have the neoclassical period. The classical period uh, coming back again. That's why neo. The neo. Neo means new. Neoclassical period can be divided into three subsets. Uh, which is like the Restoration Age, the Augustan Age, and the Age of Sensibility. Literature of this time is known for its use of philosophy, reason, skepticism, wit, and refinement. Wit and refinement and satire also actually flourish. The neoclassical period also marks the first great age of literary criticism in English. Uh, the Restoration Period, okay, first section there. Uh, from 1660 to 1700 is marked by the restoration of the monarchy and the triumph of reason and tolerance over religious and political passion. So when the Puritans were ruling, uh, it it was uh, religious and uh, highly intensely, you know, intolerant in a way. Uh, and the people were fed up of it. They called the king to come back, and that's how monarchy was restored, which is what we call as restoration. And uh, the restoration uh, uh, produced, you know, an abundance of prose and poetry, and the distinctive comedy of manners known as restoration comedy. And it was during the restoration that Milton published Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. Hmm? So Milton's uh, epic, one of the epics in English uh, language is Milton's Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. Each, uh, like, uh, Paradise Lost consists of like 12 books, 12 volumes, 12 uh, different books. And uh, altogether it is said that Milton took like nearly 20 years to complete. And by the time he was blind also. And he uh, actually, uh, the verses came to him and he needed a scribe to write it down. That's how the wor works were completed. It took nearly 20 years for him to complete. Uh, so other major writers of this era included Dryden, uh, John Wilmot, second Earl of Rochester, and John Locke. Then comes the English Augustan Age. It derives its name from the br brilliant literary period of Virgil and Ovid under the Roman Emperor Augustus. So that's why we have the word Augustan Age. Uh, like a, a reference to the brilliant literary period when Virgil and Ovid used to write, which was during the time of Roman Emperor Augustus. So based on that, we have the Augustan Age. Uh, in English literature, the Augustan age, which began from 1700 and went on till 1745, refers to literature with the predominant characteristics of refinement, clarity, elegance, and balance of judgment. Well-known writers of the Augustan age included Jonathan Swift, Alexander Pope, Daniel Defoe. And a significant contribution of this time period included the release of the first English novels by Defoe, uh, uh, Daniel Defoe, and, and the novels of character Pamela by Samuel Richardson, which is important for us, right? So it was during the Augustan age that the first English novels uh, were published. Now, during the age of sensibility, Literature reflected the worldview of enlightenment 
and began to emphasize instinct and feel feeling rather than judgment and restraint so the next age age of sensibility where literature was beginning to reflect the views of enlightenment where feeling was given importance right instinct and feeling was given more importance rather than uh, judgment and restraint so a growing sympathy for the middle ages during this age of sensibility sparked an interest in medieval ballads and folk literature uh what was uh, predominant during the middle ages you know people started looking towards that more and more so another name for this period is also the age of johnson because the dominant authors of this period were samuel johnson and his literary and intellectual circles so that's why it's also called you know the giant writer during this time was samuel johnson so that's why it's also called as the uh, age of johnson age of sensibility or age of Johnson. Now, this period also produced some of the greatest early novels of the English language, including Richardson's *Clarissa* and Henry Fielding's *Tom Jones*, published in 1749. Then comes the Romantic period of English literature. It began in the late 18th century and lasted until approximately 1832. Uh, in general, Romantic literature can be characterized by its personal nature. Uh, its strong use of feeling its abundant use of symbolism at exploration of the nature uh, and supernatural okay so symbolism was given importance nature was given importance and also supernatural was given importance in addition the writings of the romantics were considered innovative based on their belief that literature should be spontaneous imaginative personal and free uh, like wordsworth daffodils you might have studied the poem right daffodils so very spontaneous right uh, seeing the flowers and writing about it right and how he defined poetry itself right? as something that was soft cut but never so well expressed right? so uh, spontaneity was given importance during the romantic period and romantic period produced a wealth of authors including samuel taylor coleridge william wordsworth jane austen and lord byron then it was also during the romantic period that gothic literature was born uh, which novel that we studied did we talk about gothic elements who remembers the ring elements absolutely very correct so traits of gothic literature are dark gloomy settings and characters and situations that are fantastic grotesque wild savage mysterious and often melodramatic right and you, we can i easily identify this with the settings in wuthering heights with the characters that you meet in wuthering heights especially uh, catherine and heathcliff right the two of the most famous uh, gothic novelists are and radcliffe and mary shelley then we come to the victorian period okay that is uh, during the age of queen victoria so uh, it begins with the accession of queen victoria to the throne in 1837 and lasted until her death in 1901 a pretty long time because the victorian period of english literature spans over six decades around 60 years the year 1870 is often used to divide the era into early victorian and late victorian so Uh, she was on the throne for quite a long time and because of that we have uh, the victorian age is divided into early victorian age and later victorian age in general victorian literature deals with issues and problems of the day some contemporary issues that the victorians dealt with include social economic religious intellectual issues and also problems surrounding the industrial revolution so growth of industries and problems regard uh, connected with the industrial revolution G- uh, growing class tensions between the rich and the poor the early feminist movements pressure towards political and social reform we have been talking about these things with regard to the introductions that we did for many of the novels that we studied right how social reforms and political reforms were being introduced what was happening in england at that time the impact of darwin's theory of evolution on philosophy and religion all of these uh, form uh, important 
thematic concerns in Victorian literature. Some of the most recognized authors of the Victorian era include Alfred Lord Tennyson, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and her husband, Robert Barrett Browning, uh, Matthew Arnold, uh, then Charles Dickens, Charlotte Bronte, uh, George Eliot, Thomas Hardy. So some of these novelists we have studied also. Within the Victorian period, two other literary movements okay, can be noted. Uh, one is that of the pre-Raphaelites, which existed from 1848 to 1860. And then we have the movement of aestheticism and decadence, which is uh, something that existed from 1880 to 1900. Uh, now, in 1848, a group of English artists, including Dante Gabriel Rossetti, formed the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. It was a group that they formed. Some of the early, uh, some of the English artists. It was the aim of this group to return painting to a style of truthfulness and simplicity and religious devotion that had reigned prior to Raphael and the high Italian Renaissance. So they wanted to go back to a time uh, in the history of art that existed before Raphael, before Italian Renaissance. And that is why they call it pre-Raphaelite, the time of pre-Raphaelites. Okay, so Rossetti and his literary circle, which included his sister Christina, uh, incorporated these ideals into their literature, into their writing. So the ideals expressed by these artists was incorporated into literature. And the result was that of the literary uh, subset called the pre-Raphaelites, uh, pre-Raphaelite group of writers. Now, the other uh, age that we talk about here is aestheticism and decadence, another part of the Victorian age. So aestheticism and decadence movement of English literature grew out of the French movement of the same name. Whatever happened in France also affected uh, English you know, or Britain. Uh, the authors of this movement encourage experimentation and held the view that art is totally opposed to natural norms of morality. So uh, art doesn't have anything to do with uh, the, the uh, natural norms of morality. Art doesn't have to stick to any norms or rules of morality. That's what they believe. The style of literature opposed the dominance of scientific thinking and defied the hostility of society to any art that was not useful or did not teach moral values. So this was a time when, you know, the art was expected to teach something. Moral values was like, you know, part of what was expected as an outcome of a, a work of art. But these people belonging to the group of, uh, you know, aestheticism and decadent movement, they did not think that art needed to follow any rules regarding any sense of morality or any sense of uh, answerability to any established uh, moral values. Okay, And that is how this uh, uh, movement gave birth to the phrase that is art for art's sake. You, know, that, that you might have heard of this phrase, art for art's sake. Art is important for its own sake. It doesn't have to teach anything. It doesn't have to be didactic in its purposes. So uh, art for art's sake was born from this idea, which was part of the movement of aestheticism and decadence, which was uh, impacted from what was happening in France, actually. And a well-known author of the English aestheticism and decadence movement is Oscar Wilde. Then after that, we come to the Edwardian period, which is a time of King Edward VII and spans the time from Queen Victoria's death in 1901 to the beginning of the First World War in 1940. And during this time, British Empire was at its height. The wealthy lived lives of material luxury. However, four-fifths of the English population lived in squalor. So the divide between the rich and the poor was at its maximum. The writings of the Edwardian period reflect and comment on these social conditions. For example, uh, writers such as George Bernard Shaw and H.G. Wells attacked social injustice and the selfishness of the upper classes. Other writers of the time include uh, writers like William Butler Yeats, then Joseph Conrad, uh, Rudyard Kipling, Henry James and E.M. Foster. So 
Conrad and E.M. Foster, belonging to the Edwardian period, talking about the divide that existed between the rich and the poor, right? Talking about the social conditions that uh, existed during the Edwardian period. Then, then after that, after the Edwardian period, uh, which was there till the beginning of the World War One, uh, First World War in 1914, and then we have uh, Georgian period. So this uh, refers to the British literature that is named after the reign of George V, starting from 1910 to 1936. Many writers of the Edwardian period continued to write during the Georgian period. So it, it, this is, as I told you, not a watertight compartment. So writers who were writing during the Edwardian period continued to write during the time of King George V also. So uh, overlapping sort of into the Georgian period. This era also produced a group of poets known as the Georgian poets. These writers, now regarded as minor poets, were published in four anthologies, four uh, collections of poetry books, uh, anthologies, entitled Georgian Poetry, which was published by Edward Marsh between 1912 and 1922. And Georgian poetry tends to focus on rural subject matter and is traditional in its technique and form. So they were minor poets, okay, Georgian period, writers during the Georgian period. And after that, we come to the modern period. Uh, the modern period applies to British literature uh, written since the beginning of the World War I in 1940. Others of the modern period have experimented with subject matter, form, and style, and have produced achievements in all literary genres. The poets of the period include uh, Yeats, T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot is like one of the top poets of the modern period, right? What is the name of his poem? T.S. Eliot's greatest poem, poem of wait. The Wasteland. Yes, The Wasteland. The wasteland. Mm -hmm. the wasteland. Yeah. So Yeats, T.S. Eliot, Dylan Thomas, and Shama Zadie. Uh, and novelists of this period include James Joyce, D.H. Lawrence, and Virginia Woolf. So James Joyce, we have already studied, right? Now, dramatists of this period included writers like uh, Noel Coward and Samuel Beckett. Uh, Samuel Beckett, uh, who wrote the play about the uh, Canterbury, uh, the Shrine of Canterbury and uh, and what happened, you know, what led to the um, sanctity of the Shrine of Canterbury. I hope you know the story. Anyway, following World War II from 1939 to 1945, see, following after the World War II from 39 to 45, the postmodern period of literature developed. Postmodernism blends literary genre and styles and attempts to break free of modernist forms. So uh, whatever happened during the what we call as a modern period, you know, everything they tra tried to shatter and break free from all that was uh, being followed during the modernist period. Now, this is a time after the Second World War. Postmodern literature is a form of literature which is marked both stylistically and ideologically by a reliance on such literary conventions as fragmentation, paradox, unreliable narrators, unrealistic and downright impossible plots, games, parody, paranoia, fear, uh, paranoia, fear, dark humor, uh, black comedy, and authorial self-reference. The author talking about himself, right? Authorial self-reference. All of these things form uh, some of the features of postmodern literature. So everything, you know, fragmentation is there, uh, paradox, uh, all the uh, juxtaposition and paradox that comes in, uh, unreliable uh, narrators, okay? All of these form uh, part and parcel of the way in which postmodern literature was written. And postmodern authors, they tend to reject outright meanings in their novels, stories, and poems and instead highlight and celebrate the possibility of multiple meanings. So uh, it's not, they don't believe in happy, having a, a kind of closed endings. It's almost always an open ending. 
complete lack of meaning also they celebrate this lack of meaning because that was the kind of world that they uh, were living through post the second world war where every sense of order and sense of uh, uh, stability had been shattered i mean going through covid as we are now we can completely identify with what they might have felt right so this was the way in which they were writing within a single literary work you would find you know them celebrating the possibility of multiple meanings not just one meaning that they concentrated on and postmodern literature also often rejects the boundaries between high and low forms of art and literature as well as distinctions between different genres and forms of writing and storytelling so there was no distinction between uh, art and uh art in the sense uh, in the field of art or in field of literature of what was called high uh, and low uh, high in the sense catering to like you know a more um, a, a more studied approach and the low which was which we can broadly say something that caters to a more wider uh, uh, wider you know spectrum of people they refuse to make any distinction between high and low or uh, everything they consider to be literature then instead of following standard modernist literary quest for meaning in a chaotic world post modern literature tends to eschew means give up often playfully the very possibility of meaning so if modern literature was trying to find meaning from the chaos around them in post modern literature you find the writers eschewing or giving up the very possibility of uh, developing a sense of meaning the postmodern novel story or poem is often presented as a parody of the modernist literary quest for meaning almost like a uh, like a parody like you know uh, an imitation in a humorous way of this modernist quest for meaning so this kind of makes fun of this modernist search for meaning and postmodernists uh, do not search for meaning uh, completely discount the possibility of arriving at a sort of meaning so that is postmodern literature then uh, this last slide you know i i want to tell you about some of the stylistic techniques uh, that are often used in postmodern literature we have come across many of these words okay but just to you know recap so one of these elements that uh, postmodernist uh, stylistic techniques that you come across very frequently are pastiche uh, what is pastiche okay. the taking of various ideas from previous writings and literary styles and pasting them together to make a new style okay so taking uh, from previous writings styles and material from previous writings and pasting them together to make a new style that is the pastiche then we have elements of intertextuality so the acknowledgement of previous literary works within another literary work so we talk about another literary work within another literary work that is an intertextuality then metafiction the act of writing about writing or making readers aware of the fictional nature of the very fiction that they are reading so the writer does not uh, try to make the reader believe that this is real uh, the writer tries to make the readers understand that this is fiction this is about fiction so that is metafiction the fictional nature of what they are reading okay metafiction then they also use temporal distortion that is the no use of non linear timelines and narrative techniques in the story uh going into the past and going into the future not not actually uh, following this linear sort of narration like uh, uh, for example in the prime of miss uh, jean brody right where the narration does not follow a linear time it it jumps forward it uh, goes backward so that kind of jumping in uh, temporal distortion is happening the time distortion happens then minimalism the use of characters and events which are decidedly common and non exceptional characters uh like these heroes or central characters do not have any superhuman abilities they are just uh, non exceptional characters 
characters they're just ordinary people so this is this can be said to be a use of a minimalistic tendency to depict characters as very common very normal very ordinary even the events are very ordinary uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum we have maximalism disorganized lengthy and highly detailed writing so they employed all of these things minimalism and maximalism and also magical realism introduction of impossible or unrealistic events into a narrative that is otherwise realistic so uh, in a realistic novel suddenly introducing something which is entirely unrealistic uh, so that becomes magical realism and then uh, faction the mixing of actual historical events with fictional events uh fact and fiction together okay without clearly defining what is factual and what is fictional so factional becomes a mix of both fiction and fact factional then uh also reader involvement another aspect of this uh often uh, through direct address to the reader and the open acknowledgement of the fictional nature of the events being described so reader involvement reader response is uh, involved is taken into account by directly addressing the reader uh, also uh, being uh, open or blunt about the fictional nature of what they are reading the fictional nature of the events that are being described in the novel all these are elements of the postmodern literature so that's uh, what i wanted to uh, tell you guys uh, with respect to the way in which to write the essay uh, approach uh, the different ages that we have covered i hope it has been helpful to you uh and uh yeah i hope you understood what we read right now i will send you the copy of this also and yeah uh so i thought that we will also like kind of you know briefly uh discuss the assignment uh, questions that you have to write uh, july uh, july admissions okay uh the questions uh based on block 1 to 9 uh, i don't know whether you have started writing you started me okay Uh, so let me just uh, read the first question here do you think fielding's attempts to correct distortions in human behavior through the moral viewpoint of tom jones so uh, do you think fielding attempts to correct distortions in human behavior through the moral viewpoint of tom jones uh, what do you think tom jones as a character right uh is not a character who is faultless he has his own weaknesses right uh he has his own shortcomings uh and uh, a fielding does not attempt to hide that he does not want to present to us a perfect character he rather try seems to be telling us that you know uh although as a human being you know we are not perfect no one is perfect neither was tom he also like he he had relationships with many women and he led a kind of you know carefree easy going sort of life right but his character doesn't stay there uh, going through life's experiences he understands what was wrong and he redeems himself through this maturity that comes to him at a later stage in the novel so uh, uh, the the negative qualities that you see in tom jones does not actually uh remain like that right uh, and also we can say the uh, writer is not lecturing to us that you know human beings are not supposed to have any bad qualities he is rather presenting to us uh, a normal picture of a human being with all uh, the gray shades in between right uh, but the, the difference that you see here is that um, although tom uh, possesses a lot of negative qualities we still kind of support tom because we are able to understand the innate goodness that he has 
as opposed to the villainy that you will find in characters like blissel so through presenting various characters in contrast we do understand that uh, fielding is also trying to kind of you know uh, show us right what is the right thing presenting the contrasts in these characters so we do when we make a analysis or comparison and contrast between these characters right even allworthy uh, he he does have his own weaknesses uh, but he also has points that redeem him and also uh, with respect to the different uh, sections right classes uh, although uh, sophia's father is very uh, very selfish we can say and tries to force her to marry the man that he wants she is able to put her foot down uh, and she runs away from home but then she also insists that uh, i will not marry uh, uh, anyone uh, without getting my father's permission that is also there so uh, through this juxtaposition of uh, what is right uh, and also uh, giving us and giving us a more easy way on this question of morality he is actually trying to tell us what are the qualities that we can look for right so uh, basically the moral point of view is presented but not in a very didactic way in a, not in a way of a moralistic sermon it's not presented like that and that was very different as was actually his reaction to the novels that were written earlier so he was his uh, writing was fielding's writing was very different from the other writers of the period okay so do bring in all these points there then uh, what are the various narrative techniques in wuthering heights okay evaluate or examine the various uh, narrative techniques in wuthering heights so uh, wuthering heights is a complex novel right in the sense that mm, we are entering into the story when ma- majority of the story has already taken place so we get to listen to it right and how do we listen through these narrators like uh, one of you said earlier the primary first narrator that we encounter is that of lockwood and we are also outsiders just like lockwood we are looking into the world of uh wuthering heights and uh, uh to lockwood you know it takes time to understand what is happening he first listens to another narrator that is nelidi who tells uh, him of what has happened and so the narration progresses you know from the outer elements to inner and going deeper and it goes further in when he is given uh, when he takes shelter in wuthering heights uh, during a storm and he is given the room uh, of catherine and how he happens to come across the diary of catherine so there we come across another narration and this narration is taking us into the imaginary lives right and into the uh, mind of these characters apart from the vocal narration that is happening we also get a narration of what is happening in the mind of the character by reading the diary and lockwood himself writes in his diary uh, so uh, in all of these you know lockwood nelly and the diary of catherine are all narrations that take us into what is happening in wuthering heights as also is the time period so we we are uh, approaching it when most of the story has already taken place uh, we are like lockwood looking in from outside and uh, lockwood comes to spend i think he comes to thrush cross grange uh, in around the month of november and he takes some time to Uh, recover in january he gets to hear some of the narration from uh, nelly and he so in he so taken up with the story of heathcliff that he wants to understand it more and more and he comes back i think around september uh, of the same year he comes back and when he comes back he he understands the picture t- you know turns complete when he comes back in september Uh, because when he comes first to wuthering heights he sees the gates locked but when he comes back in september with heathcliff is already dead and 
Catherine and Hareton uh, are in a relationship and he notices the change. So that through this narration, through his observant eye, uh, the narration comes full circle, we can say. We also understand the changes that are happening. So the kind of narration that uh, the writer introduced takes us as readers deeper and deeper into the story. And this was very, very important because uh, we are listening to it, what has happened, the background of the story. We're listening, listening to it through the observations of Lockwood and through the narrations of the characters like in LED. So the narrative technique is very important, like the outer framework. If you remember, we discussed that, right? Like a picture frame from the outer uh, framework to the inner uh, elements of the picture we are taken deeper and deeper. Then uh, Pip Pastella relationship in Great Expectations. Illustrate with examples. Look at that. So you have to bring in uh, examples there. And others also you have to bring in examples. Whichever point you mentioned, like we discussed in essay writing details, you bring in, illustrate your points with examples from the text. So one point and a suitable example to illustrate that point. Uh, remember that. Keep that in mind. What can you say about the Pipestella relationship? Pip, the first time he sees Estella is fascinated with her, right? Her beauty, her uh, breathing and all of these things, right? Fascinates him. So, uh, and also we notice right from the beginning that uh, the definitive character of their relationship is the difference in their backgrounds, right? While Pip comes from a very uh, uh, poor background. Estella, uh, growing up with Miss Havisham, is growing in the lap of luxury, right? Uh, or a high class uh, background she has, belonging to this big uh, house, right? So they, uh, there is a difference uh, between the two of them. Uh, in terms of class, in terms of economics, there is a difference between the two of them. And uh, we can say that this difference in economics is what uh, propels him to try to make a gentleman of himself. So the great expectations that are born in Pip's heart uh, is born from uh, this feeling of uh, growing into someone who can become a partner to Estella. Uh, so he is very conscious of his lower stature and he wants to grow up to uh, a kind of social stature where Miss Havisham would think that he's fit to become Estella's partner. And when he comes into this inheritance, he thinks that it is Miss Havisham who might have, uh, you know, given him this inheritance with the intention of uh, giving Estella to him. So uh, the economic divide is what kind of defines their relationship. And also a very important point is how Estella reacts to him. Estella does not waste any moment to point out how lowly Pip is in comparison to herself. Right? She, she never uh, treats him uh, with kindness. She always snubs him. She points out how his hands are coarse and, uh, you know, weathered by uh, work. Right? So how, how ordinary, how common he is. Uh, as opposed to how uh, high class she is. She never loses an opportunity to uh, make fun of him, okay? uh, ridicule him. And also there is another important point where uh, uh, Estella is uh, being brought up by Miss Havisham. Miss Havisham is someone who is completely uh, distorted. Her heart is something that is completely distorted by being abandoned at the altar by her lover, uh, Compison. And uh, this uh, anger, this sense of revenge, bitterness, you know, uh, develops into a sense of revenge towards all men. And she passes that on. She tutors, she coaches uh, Estella to not love any man, but rather to break the heart of every man that she comes into contact with. And uh, uh, also we have Estella agreeing to marry Drummel. When asked why she could not marry Pip, she says that uh, I'm incapable of love and uh, uh, Drummel would be more like, you know, 
she wouldn't mind breaking the heart of drummel as much as she would probably uh, that of pip so towards the end you can say that probably stella has understood what it is uh, but then uh, we are not very sure of what it is but definitely there is this division between them there is a relationship which is completely uh, uh, completely spoiled because of the uh, way in which miss havisham has uh, coached or tutored estella to become a breaker of hearts hmm? uh, and uh, one more thing is that uh, pip thinks of estella as someone from a high uh, high family high birth but it's actually in reality uh, estella is the one who is uh, born of magwitch the criminal and uh, maggie who was uh, an, a servant who was accused of being a murderess so uh, in fact if you look at the legitimacy of their birth pip was actually more of a legitimate born in a more legitimate way than uh, estella was so that is the reality but uh, then uh, what happens in the novel is that they are both placed on different uh, social levels and the complications that come with it you have to support your answer with suitable examples also okay i hope you are able to understand what i'm saying yes ma'am okay now going to the fourth question uh, how are issues of race and imperialism woven into the narrative of heart of dark so heart of darkness takes us into belgian congo you could give those examples you know the the uh, the fight that was happening to grab control of congo and what exactly the the uh, amount of violence that was uh, recorded that happened in belgian congo millions of people being killed how this whole imperialistic venture was uh, uh, presumed like they were saying it is for this whole purpose of uh purpose of um, what is it uh purpose of uh, civilizing the natives but uh, the true nature of civilization we already encountered when we read the novel right how it was just loot and plunder how the natives were treated like very bad almost you know uh, in human nature in which the uh, the natives were treated you could give examples Uh, remember we talked about how the skulls were placed on the poles in front of the house right or i mean many examples you take examples and give those examples and also this whole question of imperialism uh, for uh, marlow the narrator we can say when the narration begins he, they are floating he is narrating the story while floating on a uh, ship on the thames right the thames uh, on the banks you know london uh which is very the very you know headquarters of imperialistic uh, journeys right o- of this colonialistic journey so the story is beginning from there the london the seat of imperialism and uh, when the story moves you know you see cloud the uh, storm clouds gathering and one of the characters remarks about the dark heart of the clouds which is metaphoric in a way right we are going into the dark heart of imperialistic policies and what does marlow see when he travels to the heart of uh, congo how uh, he sees uh, what kurds has done how he has inflicted so much of terror uh, and how he has come to think of himself like a god there almost in the image of a god right he is he is lost in awareness of who he is he is acted with uh, the kind of uh, hand of god there so taking over complete power which makes him mad uh, which is again reflected you know when he dies with his dying words the horror the horror because that is a moment of realization when he understands the the extent of the havoc that he has wreaked uh, in the name of civilizing the natives what has really happened he realizes it and that's why the words the horror the horror comes and uh, uh, how kurds becomes this uh, symbol uh, of what happens you know when uh, this uh, void of imperialism happened right uh, kurds is a best example of how it decays how it rots within itself 
and also the way in which the natives are presented especially the uh, the the woman the black woman who is the mistress of um, <clears throat> kurds the grace with which she is presented you can contrast with with how the intended is shown uh, back uh, in uh, london how the intended is shown uh, how uh, she is unaware of the reality of the man that she is betrothed to uh, so that is a contrast there okay uh, and how uh, bring in those elements there okay which are like you know uh, uh, ex examples of how race is shown how uh, uh, the africans versus the europeans are portrayed the contrast in the way in which they are portrayed the assumptions that are made with regards to the race and also this whole imperialistic uh, venture which is nothing more than uh, a total uh, you know plundering total robbery of uh, the gold and i mean uh, the wealth of not gold in that sense the ivory and all other precious things that they rob from africa then muriel sparks handling of time in the prime of miss jean crowley post modern novel it has all these competence of post modern novel that we just read now especially this temporal distortion the element of temporal distortion that we read now how she plays with time right uh, i gave you two words that they remember does anyone remember flashing forward and flashing backwards muriel spark the the narration is not uh, in a linear way at all right the time sequence is not uh, narrated in a linear way in muriel spark uh the prime of miss jean crowley we uh, jump forward into time and we also skip backwards into time so there is flash forwards and also flash backs flash forward is called prolapses flash backwards or flash backs is called uh, analepsis so employing this uh, prolapses and analepsis uh, muriel spark is able to show us how uh this actually takes us to the present to to explain what happens uh, we have to look into the future of how the influence of miss jean brody plays in the lives of these girls in the future uh, and how uh, when they were young when they were small girls how she exerted complete force over them complete power over them Uh, and they were too young to question her but as time passes when they reach age of 16 they learn to uh, question her yet even in the in when you flash forwards even when we are taken into the future we realize that these girls still look on uh, or really under still see uh, miss brody as someone who has acted upon they are characters beneficially including sandy who becomes a nun she does uh, concede she does agree that there have been elements uh, uh, of what miss brody taught them that went into their makeup their personalities when they grew up at the same time when you presented this picture of what has happened in the past uh, like a contrast we understand that miss brody has tried to infuse these girls with fascist thoughts uh, praising masolini and characters like that so we are uh, we are taken from the present into the past to kind find a to kind of understand what the teacher had been doing trying to manipulate the minds of these girls she describes the brody set as uh, what is it as as um, herself as a head and the girls as a body right so which kind of very clearly illustrates that uh, she wanted to you know uh, think for them she wanted them to act the way she wanted them to act so she was manipulating them so these things are brought uh, very forcefully very starkly into our understanding the readers understanding when the writer plays with the time by using these techniques of analepsis and prolapse so uh, make sure all these points are brought into your answer i think that has given you some kind of idea on how to go about this paper is there something that you want to add? Yeah, definitely definitely thank you good huh? so 
uh, if there's anything that you want to ask me. Shall I stop sharing? Ma'am, uh, I must thank you actually. There are no words to thank you. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Because you. you are very excellent in your work and very much dedicated to your work, I must tell you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for attending. I, I see I have 25 people here. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes. Uh, Ma'am, can you advise the which subject is good for the second year? I'm a bit confused for that too. Okay, I, I don't think I'm in a position to, you know, tell you which uh, optional to take. Uh, like someone asked me in the last class also. Uh, I, I, I don't think I, I can tell you, you know, this is what you should take, right? Do you think I, a teacher can say that? I don't think so, right? What I can advise is that you, you look at the optionals, okay? Read the descriptions, take out the syllabus, read it and see what you feel connected to. That is what I would suggest. Okay? Yeah, all right, ma'am. Thanks. All right. Uh, that's the best way to answer that, I think. Yes? Ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma ma if you can, you can like, if you... I can't hear you. Ma'am, uh, if you can, yes, uh, ma'am, uh, you can share your email ID if you have any queries. We can mail it to you if you don't mind, ma'am. Oh, but uh, I'm I think I have a WhatsApp group which I'm sharing with all of you guys. Uh, yes, ma'am. Is that okay if we WhatsApp you? Because I thought it will be a uh, yeah. disturbance for you. Not, not anything. No, if you have, I mean, uh, yeah, not for just anything, but if there is something really oh, important, you can just wait. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Huh? So you have my okay. number, no? So you can ask. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you for all your wonderful In fact, some of you have already texted and asked certain things. So it's okay. Hmm? I'll try to help as much as I can. Okay, all right then. So, shall we call it a day? Thank you so much, ma'am. You're welcome. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, all right then. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, lot. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And do study well. The best way to thank me is to Ma'am, did well. you share your end sheet? Yeah. The end in sheet, did you share it? Uh, actually, it's not me who shares these uh, attendance sheets it's from the regional center Kochi uh, so yeah it is there please fill in the attendance sheet yeah, it's there it's, uh, there in your uh, chat messages you can uh, check it you see that who asked me the question can you see that the attendance sheet is there in your chat yes like ma we can see we yeah, I can share it again if you like. Here. Okay, I've shared it again. Okay. So, are you all from Kerala or from outside? So, we are having I'm heavy rain from Kerala. Yeah, dude. I mean, is it raining in your place? There's heavy rain here. Yes, ma'am, it is raining here too. Yeah, very heavy. So stay safe, everyone. Study well, do well, and I'll see you sometime. Okay? Bye bye then. Are you okay, in Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Okay, welcome. Bye bye. Thank you.